We must be changed in new creations. Turn with me, me to Matthew um, is it 13. Yes, Matthew chapter 13. chapter 13 verse 24 this is Jesus speaking Matthew chapter 24 it's page 934 for those who have the scriptures Bob Jesus speaks another parable and he put forth them saying the rain of the heavens has become like a man who sowed good seed in his fields but while men slept, the enemy came and sowed darnel or tares, among the wheat and went away. Okay, these tares or the darnel looks exactly like wheat as it grows up. The only difference is, is the wheat produces fruit, the tare does not. Now look at what he says. And when the blade sprouted and bore fruit, then the darnel also appeared, or the tare appeared. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? From where then does this darnel come? And he said to them, A man, an enemy, did this. And the servant said to him, Do you wish then that we go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather them up, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time of the harvest, I shall say to the reapers, First gather the tares, bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my granary. We should take note to that. What's he do first? He gathers the, the tares, bundles them up, throws them into the fire. What are the tares? Over here, Jesus explains it. Verse 37. Answer, and he said to them, He who is sowing good seed is the Son of Man, Jesus. Everything that was made was made by him, right? Nothing that was nothing was that is made was not made by him. And the field is the world, and the good seed are the sons of the rain, but the darnel or the tares are the sons of the wicked one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. As the tares then is gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this age. As I read that one, when I first started coming to the Lord, as I said early on in this sermon today, that I was taught and the popular belief is that we will be raptured and taken out of the way. <clears throat> what is this parable Jesus speaks? Is Jesus just kind of ignorant, not real sure what's going to happen at the end? No, he says that we will gather the wicked first, bundle them together and burn them in the fire. That should be our first clue that something different is going on than what we're being taught. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 take note 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 that will be page 1155 for those who have the scriptures now listen those who have ears to hear let them hear those who have eyes to see, let them see. And those who have a heart to repent, please repent. Let no one deceive you in any way because the falling away is to come first. The man of lawlessness is to be revealed. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim or that is worshipped so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place of Elohim, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that I told you while I was with you? And now you know what restrains for him to be revealed in this time. For the secret of lawlessness is already at work. Only until he who now restrains comes out of the midst. Then the lawless one shall come, be revealed, whom the master shall consume with the spirit of his mouth 
and bring to naught the manifestation of His coming. The Lord Jesus will come with the sword out of His mouth, being the Word. He will speak Satan and his little minions and all those who follow Him will be bound up. Kind of goes with that parable right there. We'll be bound up. Now for the part where I kind of anger everybody that wants to believe that we're going to be taken out. Oh Lord. Matthew 24. Verse 37, Matthew 24. We kind of hit on this last week. And as in the days of Noah shall, come, shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. What happened in the days of Noah? It was only evil continually. The fallen angels have corrupted the DNA of mankind. They have planted Satan and his angels. Have planted the tares. There are humans that look just like me and you, only their DNA are corrupted. That's why God wiped mankind off the face of the earth the first time, because he had to cleanse it. Noah, being righteous in God's, God's eyes, was not right because of his acts, his works, his heart, or anything else. Noah was right with God because his DNA had not been corrupted. So as the days of Noah, so shall also be the coming of man. Today we have tares among us. We have people among us that look like us, smell like us, but in their DNA, they are of the enemy. They are the tares. For as we're in the days of Noah before the flood, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 40, Then two shall be in the field, the one is taken, one is left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal, one is taken, one is left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your master come. What was the parable we just read? Gather the tares first, bind them up, and cast them into hell. Second Thessalonians. Tells us that none of this will come until the son of perdition be revealed. What is the scriptures telling us? We started out in Genesis showing that we have to watch and look at the words that God is telling us. Not what we feel. What's happening to the one that is taken and one is left. Do you want to be taken or do you want to be left? I want to be left. The ones taken are to be bundled up and thrown in the fire. I know this goes against what 90% of the populate of the popular view of, of of Christianity today. I know it does. And sometimes I wish I didn't have to preach some of these messages. But if I don't preach the truth, who will? If you don't hear the truth, who's to hear it? Two shall be taken, one shall be left. I got one last verse and then or one passage and then we will try to wrap it up i know this is long but i have to i have to get this out y'all have to i'm not the only one speaking this though there are other men jeremiah three sixteen pastors who are after god's own heart who are shepherds doing what god said do romans chapter 10 this is page 1099 romans chapter 10 starting verse 12 because there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. What do you mean? There's no distinction. Paul's fiction explain in the next chapter that if you're Greek or you're whatever your background is, your physical um, heritage, that we're all one in Christ. That we're all to be one, the same. There is no difference between the church and Israel. 
Israel church, church, Israel. Same thing. Just like I said, whenever I adopt a child, I don't have separate rules. I don't have, he, he is mine now. Or she is mine. She is of my household. I'm not going to set her apart and say, you know what, you stay over there and you, you know, I'm going to feed you beans and rice while my kids get to eat this. I'm not going to bring this one in and say, you know what? I am going to treat you special. I'm going to make you, I'm going to do everything better for you because I know you had a hard life. And I'm going to make my kids go through hell because they're mine and I've already taught them how to handle it. No, I treat them the same. Why does Christianity today teach that we are different than the Jews? We are different than the Benjamites, different than the Danites, the house of Israel, the 12 tribes. Why do we teach that? That we're somehow special. We're not. Peter says of a, a, of a truth that I know. That there is no partiality with God. Is Peter a liar? No. Peter may be a liar. But not when he's inspired to write the word. Because there's no distinction between Jew or Greek. For the same master of all is rich. To all calling upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can find the same thing in Joel 2.32. That's Old Testament. This is New Testament. Should be the same thing. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? That's a very powerful statement. If we're not careful. I can say, you know what? Jesus is my Lord. Man, that girl looks hot. My wife will never know. I can be so simple as, you know what? I only work four hours today, but I'm going to write 12 down on my timesheet. Nobody will know. It's a simple little lie. Sin, sin, right? If I believe God and I believe there's consequences for my sin, there's a fear there. I'm not going to do these things. Then I don't do it out of, of obligation. I'm not serving my Lord out of obligation for after I realize and believe who He is. See, I don't think there's a God. I don't hope that there's a God. I know without a shadow of a doubt that God is who He says He is and He exists. It took me a time to get to that trust, that belief, that faith. Faith come by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. We're going to get there. Because Scripture says, whoever puts his... Oops, no, that's right. Am I? No, verse 14, sorry. How then shall they call on Him whom they have not believed? If you don't believe and trust in God, you're not going to call upon Him. How shall they believe in Him whom they have not heard? If no one's there to tell them about Jesus, how are they going to believe? How shall they hear without one proclaiming? Jeremiah 3.16 How shall they proclaim if, they're, if they are not sent? As it has been written, How pleasant are the feet of those who bring the good news of peace, who bring the good news of good. However, not all obeyed the good news, for yes, Yehu, or Isaiah, says, Yahweh who has believed, Yahweh, who has believed our report? So then belief comes by hearing, or faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Elohim, the word of God. I'm not here today because just one day I'm out there doing my thing and went, oh, there's a God. I need to go follow him. No. God set in place certain men in my life to start telling me about him. I may have rejected him for a time, but God set in place men to tell me about him. If God takes all the saints off this planet, who's to tell the lost? Oh, it's the two witnesses. Okay, you believe that. I believe there's two witnesses coming. They will proclaim just like it says in Revelation. I do believe that. But I can't get down with we're special. And God's going to take us away from this tribulation. When I see how the saints are treated in Rome, year A.D. 67, I see how the saints are treated in the year 300, 1500, the Reformation, Martin Luther, John Calvin, 
and the light started teaching and preaching things that was not popular and it cost them their lives. I believe it was John Calvin that they uh, burned at the stake and then the church wasn't satisfied with that 90 years later, dug his bones up, made sure they burnt the rest of his bones to make sure that that heresy was gone. John Calvin did not speak heresies. He spoke the truth as he read it in Scripture. And the church did not like that. The world did not like that. The rapture did not show up until around the 1850s, 1860s. And it gained traction. Because like the Roman citizens who were proud of their heritage, who were proud of where they came from, and thought they were special above everyone else, America became the same. We began thinking that we are special. And so there must be some reason that we would never go through this trial and tribulation. Go over to some of these countries today and ask these Christians what they think of the rapture. They'll tell you to go get lost. Because they just lost their entire family beheaded and killed for their faith and their faith alone. We're special because we're Americans. Hallelujah. Shame on you for believing. And I'm not saying the, the ones who are the sheep of, of the flock. I'm talking about the shepherds who teach this. Shame on you. If Jesus comes and takes us out of the way, the church, the believers out of the way, oh, cool. But what happens when the scriptures that I'm, I'm showing y'all, and there's many, many more, it would take me weeks to show you all the scriptures of this. I'll show you why they believe it and why we should not. Maybe we should do that. If we believe that this rapture is coming, what happens when the Antichrist is revealed? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3. Be not deceived. What have we already been deceived of? You'll not die. Happened to Eve. Tried to happen to Jesus. You think Satan's not using that same tactic against us? You'll not die. You'll be taken out of the What happens when the lawlessness one shows up, sets up his system? Are we going to sit here as pastors and teach? It ain't happening yet. It's not. That can't be the enemy. That can't be the Antichrist. Jesus is supposed to take us away. Y'all just keep, it'll be all right, y'all. What happens then? Wake up. We have to see the truth. Verse 18, but I ask, did they not hear? Yes, indeed. Their voice went out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. But I ask, did Israel not know? For Moses says, I shall provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation, and I shall enrage you by an unwise nation. Today we are the church that have been provoking Israel to jealousy. It's going to be what brings the Israelites, the Jews, back unto God. Because we're going to find, they're going to finally see that Yeshua that died for our sins is their Messiah that they've been waiting for 6,000 years on now. But they're still in the house of God. They're still in the house of Israel. And we must be the house of Israel. Same scenario. I adopt a child. I bring them into my home. I love them. I care for them. My natural born children go, I'm out, man. And they go live however they want. They don't hear have nothing to do with me. Then the prodigal son returns. I still love this child that I adopted. Still mine. Now mine came back. Now I'm complete. That's God with us, y'all. There's no distinction between us, the church, and Israel. There's not. You can read Romans chapter 11 to get a better grasp of that. And I've, I've, I've actually taught a message on that. 
when we look at what God says. See, we went from Genesis, we went to Deuteronomy, we got into Matthew, we, we went into 2 Thessalonians. Next week we're going to get into Revelation a little bit. And we start seeing the whole full scope of God and His plan. Then this heresy that is being preached and taught in, in some churches about we're special will begin to fall the scales from your eyes and you will be able to see then you can be the one that's preaching and teaching. Jesus says you'll not maybe every now and again go through trials and tribulation. He said you're going to. Now I understand the great tribulation is going to be like mankind's never seen. He says so. We're going to get into that next week. But these, these um, early saints of Yeshua went through living hell with their families. Why are we special? I'm going to give you some good news to end this up. If you will turn with me to Zephaniah. Uh, which one? Zephaniah is a short little one. Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Crop between Haggai and Habakkuk. Page 632 if you have a scriptures Bible. Zephaniah chapter 3, starting verse 8. Get that one for me, Mikey. Z E P H A N I N H. Zephaniah 3, verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, declares Yahweh, until the day I rise up for plunder. For my judgment is to gather nations, to assemble rains, and to pour out on them my rage. All my burning wrath, for by the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. Okay. Do we see there anywhere where there's a distinction in nations? Where God's going to separate anything? No, He says, I'm going to gather all my nations to assemble them and pour out my, my wrath. I will agree with what's being taught today in the fact that we are not to endure the wrath of God. Our saint, the saints today will not endure the wrath. The great tribulation is different than the wrath of God. The great tribulation is Satan running amok on us. The foreshadow of that is in Job. God allowed Satan to wreak havoc on Job in his life. That's the foreshadowing. Amos 3 7 says that God does nothing unless He reveal it through His prophets. Where in the Old Testament do we see a foreshadowing of a coming pre tribulation rapture? That was my next question for the guy. There's not one. I've read through the entire Bible seven times and I always learn something new. I'm not saying it's not there, but I ask y'all, go look for it. If there's a foreshadow and anything in the Old Testament or even the New Testament, I'll give it that. If there's a foreshadowing of a coming, uh, coming rapture before the tribulation, show me. I haven't found it yet. God does nothing unless He reveal it through His prophets, His servants. I've got another message where we're going to go through um, Exodus pretty extensively with Moses on the mount. And we're going to see the foreshadowing of the creation of earth to the destruction and the judgment. All in Moses is on the mount. In that short little span in Exodus. Moses being a foreshadowing. There's a whole bunch of good stuff there, but it's going to take a while to break that out. There's no foreshadow of a pre-tribulation rapture, y'all. There's no foreshadow. There's nothing in the Bible that says that the six days God created earth is millions and millions of years. And I'm adamant about that because we have to believe what God says even when it goes against what we think. Now, back to the good news. Verse 9. For then I shall turn unto the people a clean lip so that they call on the name of Yahweh and serve Him with one shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring my offering. And that day you shall not be put to shame for any of your deeds in which you have transgressed against me, says God. How can I not be put to shame if I'm sinning against God? 
The grace and the mercy that was at that cross. Grace and mercy has saved me because I've called upon that name of the Lord and I believed and I trusted. For then I shall remove from your midst your proud exulting ones and you shall no more be haughty in my holy mountain. But I shall leave in your midst an oppressed and poor people and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no falsehood nor is a tongue of deceit found in their mouth for they shall feed their flocks and lie down with none to frighten them. This is post judgment shout for joy O daughter of Zion shout for joy O Israel be glad and rejoice with all your heart O daughter of Jerusalem Yahweh has turned aside your judgments he has faced your enemy who faces the enemy God does the king of Israel Yahweh is in your midst no longer need to fear evil in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear. Zion, do not let your hands be weak. Yahweh your Elohim is in your midst. Yahweh is right with us. And he's mighty to save. He rejoices over you with joy. He is silent in his love. He rejoices over you with singing. I shall gather those who grieve about the appointed time who are among you to whom its reproach is a burden. See, I'm dealing with all those afflicting you at this time. And I shall save the lame and gather those who were cast out. I shall give them for a praise and for a name in all the earth where they were put to shame. At that time, I shall bring you in. Even at that time, I gather you. For I shall give you for a name, for a praise among all the peoples of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, says Yahweh. Not only do I not see where he's, you know, I'm going to take this people for a time, then I'm going to go gather this people for a time. Not only do I not see that, I see the glory that we will live in forever and ever with the Lord. Who gathers us in? He does. I don't see the gathering and go, that would be a good idea to go over here. I don't get to do that. God's going to grab us, gather us in, and take us in together all at once. Those in dead, and those who, those who slept in sleep, and those who are still alive. All at once, and then it's game over, dude. It's over. The whole world, boom, now we build new. God gets to do all this. We don't get that choice. That's God's sovereignty. But we can't bypass the process of this. And that's what the rapture doctrine teaches is we get to bypass God's plan. Bypassing God's plan has got mankind in more trouble throughout the, throughout the centuries and, and millennia than any other thing. We don't get to bypass God's plan. Remember and think about Satan's favorite life to y'all. To me. To everyone. Y'all want to die. Everybody going to heaven. Free ride, man. Just get on in there. You're going to get to go hang out with Aunt Betty, Uncle Bob, drink, Bill, drink beer with Bill, and John and George, who you once hung out with. We're all going to drink beer at the river, and Jesus is going to come up and tell jokes. That's basically what the churches are teaching today. And that's why I'm adamant about what I teach up here, because I am going to be held responsible one day for what I teach. I know that. As you grow up and you raise up and you're matured in your spirit, you're going to be more held more responsible for what is given you. But don't let the enemy deceive you by saying you shall not certainly die. He tripped Eve up on it and he's tripping the church up on it today. 